Well, good morning and welcome to Finland Mennonite Church on YouTube. Today we are finishing our sermon series out of the book of Nahum that we've titled Questions to Consider. And last week, Pastor Nathan, he joined us and asked the question, how will God use his anger to restore, reconcile, and bring healing? And then he said he's going to leave he's going to leave that to me to answer this week. That was convenient. Thank you, Nathan, for that. So here we are. And we're going to finish this out. We're going to dive into chapter 3 together, and we're going to see if we can in fact discover the answer to that question. How will God use his anger to restore, reconcile, and bring healing? But before we get to that question, I actually have a question for you this morning to kind of help set the tone as we dive into chapter 3. And here's here's my question for you this morning. Did you ever find yourself uh saying or believing or thinking this phrase, oh, pff, that'll never happen to me. Right? Perhaps in response to some advice, the mindset is kind of along the lines of, well, you know, maybe for the average person, okay, but <laughs> I'm better than average. Right? Kind of response or thought. Silly example I used to play the game of life a lot with my kids and a family. We still have we don't play it as much anymore, but my son Logan, he would always buy the the house insurance and the auto insurance. Every time he got a car, every time he bought a house, he would absolutely buy the insurance. And he would always tell me when I bought my car or my house, "Hey dad, you should buy the house insurance." And I'd be like, "No, Logan, you don't buy house insurance." And sure enough, Almost every time I played him, I would inevitably land on the space that said flooding. Uh, if you don't have house insurance, pay forty-five thousand. House burned down. If you don't have insurance, house robbed. If you don't have insurance, and he every time would look at me and say, "Dad, I told you to buy the house insurance." Of course, I just thought that'll never happen to me. We're one time playing hockey with a friend and we got to the game we're putting our pads on and he looks at me with these big eyes he's like Chris I forgot my shin pads and after kind of giving him a hard time for how do you possibly forget your shin pads I uh offered him I said well you know what I got my shin pads I'll wear one and you wear one he's like that's not going to work I'm like yeah you just stick your one leg behind the other one if you think you're going to get hit by a puck or something like come on we can What's, we can make this happen. He's like, what if a puck hits us? I'm like, that'll never happen. Come on, we're better than that. <laughs> well, we played almost the whole game. Last shift of the game. <laughs> I'm laughing because it wasn't me. My friend goes out on the ice, and what do you know? He takes a shot directly to the knee without a shin pad on. Ooh, ooh. I think my knee still hurts thinking about that one. But we both kind of thought, eh, that'll never happen. To me, maybe you found yourself in a situation you just got to do something quick. So I'm not gonna bother putting on my safety glasses or putting on the work gloves or I just got to do a quick cut with the chainsaw. I don't need to put the chaps on. Hmm. Sometimes that works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Like the time I definitely got a metal chip shot into my eye. Ah, eh, it's just a quick cut. It won't be a big deal. I'll just get it over with. Or cutting something up some piece of wood the other day I was cutting and I got some. Dust in my eyes was the ah, but you know the the glasses are way over there. I don't need to. I'll just quickly do this. It'll never happen to me, right? How about stretching? <laughs> I kind of had the mindset of ah, my muscles will be fine, right? I'd stretch a little, but never as much as I should have. And uh, after several pulled hamstrings and a couple groin injuries. Um, You'd think I'd be better at stretching, and maybe I am a little bit, but there's still always this thing in the back of my mind, eh, I'll be fine. Or one time, uh, we had a fire burning in our backyard, and we were trying to get some stuff burned. We also had to do some running around that day, so I took a little bit of water and doused it and looked at it and went, eh, it's still smoldering a little, but eh, it'll be fine. I know these crazy things happen to other people, but that'll never happen to me. So we go off and we do our shopping, and we come down our road several hours later and, and uh suddenly i see smoke i'm like there's not supposed to be that much smoke 
right now. Anyway, we get back, and, and yeah, the fire had spread. Fortunately, it didn't spread very far, and it didn't create any lasting damage. But it was a good reminder that sometimes we're a little too quick to say that will never happen to me. See, bad things can happen when we have this kind of an attitude. Uh, my question, or my kind of thing for you to ponder, is what happens when we take this kind of an attitude, this that will never happen to me attitude, and apply it spiritually? What happens when we take this attitude and we respond to God in this way? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Maybe I asked that question. I'm glad you're following along as we answer this question. Open your Bibles if you have them to Nahum. We're going to finish this out. We're going to read chapter 3 together this morning. We're going to see as we enter this scripture, think of this question. Uh, this idea of that will never happen to me. Am I applying it? And what happens if I take that mindset and respond to God with it? So here's what it says in Nahum chapter 3 to finish out this, this minor prophet of Nahum. See what it has to say. And then we'll kind of break it down and we'll eventually come to what does this mean to you and what does this mean to me? Here's what it says. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey. The crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies, and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and will lift up your skirts over your face. I'll make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I'll throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart a sea and water her wall? Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit, put in the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. For her honored men lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunken. You'll go into hiding, and you'll seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like figs, fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, your troops, they're like women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has devoured your bars. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts. Go into the clay. Tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mold. There will the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like the locust. Multiply, multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increased your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spreads its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes like clouds of locusts settling on the fences in a, cold, in a day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There's no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? So, uh, you know what? At first glance, we, we had this question Nathan asked about... Um, what what happens and how is God going to use his anger to bring restoration, reconciliation, and, and healing? And we read through chapter 3, and, and you know what? On At first glance, um, I don't see God using <laughs> his anger for much of anything other than destruction in Nahum chapter 3. What, what about you? Uh, chapter 3, it opens with these three accusations and three questions 
that we have coming pretty rapid fire, especially the accusations. They come pretty quick. They come pretty hard and, and fast. There's three of them. In, in verse 1, we see that the people are violent. This is one accusation against the people of Assyria. They're violent, right? It's it's called the bloody city. It's, called, it's said that they're full of lies and plunder. And historically, we've already kind of gone over this. We know this about the people of Assyria. They were very bloody. They were very vicious. They were ruthless. They would use lies to their advantage. They would make false treaties with people and then attack. They would um, they would plunder then everything that they had, right? They used deception and all kinds of tactics in order to build their kingdoms. And this is the accusation, the first one that God has against them. You are violent. You are doing wrong to other people. In verse 4, we see the second one. And he calls them adulterers. Uh, he specifically says that they are uh, uh, whorings of the prostitute, right? And so this seems to imply both spiritual and physical adultery. It means people are are not acting in ways in, in alignment with, with God and what he would have as far as uh, with how they acted sexually. And it also seems like they are searching after and, and fleeing after and, and going after false gods. So they're they're cheating on God, they're cheating on each other, they're they're treating each other wrong sexually, they're exploiting people sexually, they're doing things wrong sexually. All right, so they're guilty of adultery, both spiritual and physical. And then in verses 16 and 19, we see that in addition to this violence, in addition to this kind of mindset of adultery, is this mindset of a lust for more. I had a lust for more. We see it says we inc they increase their merchants more than the stars. I don't know if you've ever looked up at the sky on a on a dark night, on a good night where you can see the stars. There's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of them, more than you can ever count by the naked eye. Uh, especially if you're out in a place where uh, some of the parks we were at over the summer were called. Uh, International dark skies, and wow, could you see stars. Um, amazing amount of stars. And you're saying, you have more merchants, you have more stores, you got more kinds of gimmicks and things than there are stars. And then verse 19, he talks about this unceasing evil. Ready? Here's the accusations. He says, uh, you're violent, you're, you're adulterous, and, and you have this unending lust for more. And those are the three accusations we see. Pretty rapid fire. Then we get to these questions. I'm going to take these one at a time with you this morning. The first question is this. He, he says, who will grieve for her? Right? Her being Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? And there's a, almost, there's a double question here because it's followed up with almost immediately. Where shall I seek comforters for you? Right? This sort of repeated question this parallel question who's going to grieve for her and in fact others not only is he going to have a hard time finding people to grieve that part of the reason is because everyone's rejoicing right we see this in verse 19 it says all who hear will clap for joy they're going to celebrate this great fall and maybe you're like why seems like pretty horrible things happening to people why would people celebrate this uh well, because verse 19, right, says, For upon whom, question number two, For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? Right? They're celebrating the fall of Nineveh because Nineveh has done some pretty bad things. They've done some pretty evil things. They have not made many friends along the way. So people are actually going to celebrate because of the fact that this group of people that has brought so much evil has now finally met their demise. You know what? It kind of reminds me of, uh, if you remember, uh, several years ago when Osama bin Laden was killed and the reports came out. And, and obviously this was a years-long manhunt and major wars being fought to go after the Taliban and, and get specifically Osama bin Laden. And when it finally happened, I remember... There were countless parades going on and celebrations all over our country here in the United States uh, when when this man was was killed, right? Very similar to what we see here. Very similar to this idea of where are we going to find people that are going to mourn and grieve this? Why? Well, because there's a lot of people celebrating. 
So is is this God using his anger to restore, reconcile, and bring healing? Right? That through the destruction of the Ninevites that uh, others can get healing and, and respite? That they can finally get the reconciliation because these big bad Ninevites were taken care of? Uh, well, well, no. No, that this isn't the, this isn't where we see God using his anger for, for these things. And I say this for two reasons. Uh, one, the Babylonians who conquered the Assyrians, they're the ones responsible for Nineveh being completely demolished. Uh, guess what? The, the Babylonians, they were pretty bad people as well. They were pretty brutal. They were pretty vicious. They did some pretty evil things along the way. Uh, they are also the ones responsible for the conquering uh, the, the, the kingdom of Judah, right? The southern kingdom, right? The north was taken out by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom of Judah, they were sent into exile by the Babylonians. Uh, and, and so the Babylonians did pretty horrible things. And then two... Remember last week we had Pastor Nathan uh, get, bring that message for us, and he said that God's patience ends with either wrath or grace? Well, chapter 3, friends, is a picture of what happens when God's patience ends with wrath. Right? That's what we see here. But what happened? Right? Like, why did it not end with grace? It certainly did before for Nineveh. We just simply have to turn back two books in our Bible, read the book of Jonah, and we see how in that book, the people of Nineveh, it does end with grace. It ends with God relenting. That God himself in Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel chapter 33, he, he says and declares, I do not delight in the death of the wicked. So why not this time? Why, why is this time different? Well, to help us see that, we need to see the third question again that was asked. And here's the third question. Are you better? Right? They were first asked, who will grieve for her? Uh, then the final question is, for upon whom has uh, not come your unceasing evil? And now the question, are you better? Are you better than Thebes? Right? This is the telling question. And maybe to understand it, we need to know a little bit more about Thebes. Well, Thebes was an Egyptian city. Uh, that was very much like Nineveh, situated around rivers, had a, 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 a kind of thriving military, a good protective system. They, they were wealthy. They were, it was a great city, kind of one of these cities that you could live in and feel, wow, we're invulnerable. Nothing can possibly go wrong. No one can possibly bring us harm. We are good to go. That will never happen to me. See, they also had allies all around them. Uh, and, and so they kind of got this idea of, wow, we're untouchable. But guess what? They weren't. They got destroyed. Right? Thebes gets routed. They get pillaged. And uh, it was by the Assyrians. Now the very ones who destroyed Thebes are themselves smugly thinking, <laughs> That will never happen to us. Only it did happen to them, right? And this is where Nahum becomes very real, very relevant, and very sobering. See, if you're like me, you're tempted to join in the celebration over the fall of Nineveh, described in verse 19. I mean, look at what they did to the people of Thebes. Uh, it says they bound people in chains. It says they cast lots for other people, and it seems to have this indication. What would you cast lots for if you're not going to take people as slaves or servants? So they bound some, they, they forced others into slavery, and then they, man, it talks about viciously killing babies. It just says, I don't even really want to read these words again, how they, how they treated uh, the people, uh, the, especially the babies, but it says her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. So you, you kind of read about how these Assyrians acted and what they did when they conquered this city of Thebes. And, and you kind of go, who isn't clapping for these people to get what they deserved? Who isn't rejoicing in 
If you remember Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 where it says the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. You're like, bring it on, God. Let them have it. Look at the evil that they're doing. Right? Pour it on. Pour it on. Bring the bring the judgment. Well, before we get too carried away, uh, you and I would do well to truly consider the same question that was posed to the Assyrians. Are you better? Right? Are you better than Thebes? Are you better than the Assyrians? Are you better than those evil, wicked sinners? Because as we just heard, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. But come on, like, we're better than the Assyrians, right? I mean, let's look at their three accusations again. Well, first one was violence, and we hear clearly their violence, and you're like, well, I never grabbed the baby by the by the foot and dashed it. Like, okay, me neither, right? But then I think of, and I look around, I go, man, you know, uh, over 50% of guys in the United States are addicted, look at pornography more than once a week, and the number of women looking at and and getting into pornography is is getting closer and closer to that number as well. Uh, they say 70 to 90 percent of college students, male college students, are looking at porn on a weekly basis. Pornography is violent. It is absolute violence towards women, towards towards children, towards towards uh, underaged uh, females. Uh, it's violence, right? And then I just think about some of the TV shows that are popular right now. You got TV shows like Dexter, Empire, and Squid Games. Games that, TV shows that are all about kind of violence. And yet we watch this as entertainment. Hmm. And maybe, maybe this will get you. Yeah. Did you ever notice that when someone does something mean to you, when you're wronged, there's sort of that internal desire to, to respond physically? <laughs> to lash out, to, to do something to bring them physical harm. That's, a, that's violence. Okay, hmm, there's violence. How about adulterers? Um, you don't ever look for fulfillment and satisfaction and things or other people outside of God? You don't ever seek your own kingdom priorities or your own glory? Instead of God's glory and God's kingdom's priorities in all situations and every thought? Yeah, yeah, I know you're probably getting uncomfortable with these because I'm getting uncomfortable with these lust for more, right? That was the third accusation was you're not just violent, you're not just adulterers, you also have a lust for more. Um, are you fully content in every area of life? the amount of money you have, with how popular you are, how many likes you get, how how many things we have, how strong we are, uh, the amount of clothing that we have, things. I, I don't know about you, but that uncomfortable feeling has straight trans has straight changed into uh, feeling really not so good actually anymore. Right, I'm I'm not better than Thebes. I'm not better than the Assyrians. I'm not better than those wicked, evil sinners. Right? Maybe you're feeling that same thing. Well, there's the good news this morning. God's patience can end with wrath, as we saw in chapter three, but as Nathan said, it can also end with grace. See, God will actually use his anger to restore, reconcile, and heal. There is a reason that Nahum 1.7 can say that the Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. But maybe you're thinking, well, how is this possible? Like, these all seem to go together. Like, how can he both not clear the guilty but also be a stronghold if you and I admit we're no better than, than wicked and evil and we too have have things that have caused us to, to rebel against our creator and deserve the punishment, right? How is this possible? Well, it's possible 
Because God stepped into the story himself. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, right? He stepped into creation and he lived this perfectly righteous life where he never sinned. He, he never lusted for more. He, he never uh, committed adultery spiritually or physically. He, he didn't have this bloodthirsty violence. Even though he was tempted in every way, Jesus overcame them all. On the night before he was crucified, uh, he prayed to the Father. He said this, My Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What cup's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the cup of God's wrath. God's anger, right, poured out on his son. See, there's a there's this twist that no one before Jesus saw coming. And it's this, God steps into creation and in Jesus, we see the fulfillment of Nahum 3 verses 5 to 7. Let me read these again to you. And remember, this is in Jesus. These are truly fulfilled. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face. And I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh. And we'd be like, wait, how does Jesus, how does he fulfill those verses? Well, see, it was Jesus on a cross, naked fully shamed, with the nations looking on and mocking, turning the Son of God into a spectacle. Right? It was Jesus who took everything we deserved. No easing his pain. His wound was grievous and fatal. As verse 19 ends by saying, you're, there's no easing your hurt, your wound is grievous. This describes the, the experience of Jesus on the cross. But the power of God was fully demonstrated when Jesus rose from the grave, conquering sin, conquering death, and providing then restoration, healing, and reconciliation in his name. So do you need healing? Come to Jesus. Do you need reconciliation? Follow Jesus. Do you long for reconciliation? Jesus can give it to you. When we realize that we, in fact, are not better, it opens our eyes to our true need for Jesus. And when we call out to him, when we ask him for help, when we ask him for strength, when we confess our wrongs and our sins, and we come to him, we find him to be exactly what Nahum promises him to be good, and a stronghold in the day of trouble. Will God's patience result in grace or wrath in your life? Only you can answer that question. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder. Thank you for this message. Thank you that even in the midst of such tough questions, such hard words, we're still led down a path of grace to be able to uh, find healing, to find reconciliation, to experience uh, restoration through you, through what you did for us. I pray for all who are watching that they would receive you, Jesus, that they would follow you, that they would read your word and, and put it into action and get to know you as, as, as Lord, as King, the God of creation, but also as friend also as someone they can turn to in a time of trouble. Lord, may we all experience you as being the good God you say you are, this stronghold in a day of trouble. And uh, may we be blessed as we turn more and more to you in everything. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, I want to thank you for joining us this morning as we finish this book of Nahum. And uh, I just want to leave you with, with this blessing as you go this week. May the Lord bless you and protect you. 
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Go in that peace. Go in the love of Christ and share it with all you come in contact with. Have a blessed week.